Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of JS Bachtut IT, the Istituto per i Beni Musicali in Piemonte and the Conservatory Giuseppe Verdi of Turin, as well as of the conference committee, I am glad to welcome our audience and our speakers to tonight's roundtable, Bach Societies Worldwide. Welcome and good evening. Our guest tonight represents some of the most important institutions and societies dedicated to Bach Worldwide. As we all know, one of the most important stages is the so-called Bach Renaissance, was the creation of the Bach Gesellschaft, a society of musicians, scholars, and music lovers to whose efforts we owe the Bach Gesellschaft Ausgabe. This monumental achievement provided the musical community with a comprehensive edition of Bach's works and dramatically contributed to the dissemination of his output. One of the merits of the Bach Gesellschaft, however, was that it helped to establish a community of musicians and scholars who admired and loved Bach's music and who eagerly awaited the publication of each volume, discussing it and frequently realizing transcriptions and arrangements of the newly published works. Being a member of the Bach Gesellschaft and a subscriber of the Bach Gesellschaft Ausgabe was a mark of identity a recognizable sign of a shared interest. Along with the Bach Gesellschaft, numerous other Bach societies were created all over the world in the last 170 years. They included societies with a primary focus on performance, sometimes born to an orchestra, a choir, or a festival or season. Others are mainly interested in scholarly studies and musicology, and some publish their own journals and reviews. Many scholars, musicians, and music lovers constantly seek the possibility of networking, both within these societies and among different realities. Interacting promotes dialogue, knowledge, expertise, and it creates opportunities for warm human encounters in the name of Bach. We hope that tonight's roundtable will be one such moment even though we are gathered in front of our computer screens rather than in a concert hall or a conference room. We are therefore glad and honored to welcome our first speaker tonight, Christine Blanken. Dr. Christine Blanken has been active since 2005 as a scholarly researcher at the Bach Archiv in Leipzig. Since 2011, she has led the Forschungsreferat 2 concerning the Bach family. Presently, she works together with Peter Volny and Christoph Wolf to the new catalog of Bach's works, Bachwerke Verzeichnis. Dr. Blanken, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome to my office in the fourth floor in Thomas Kirchhof in Leipzig. Um, I wanted to start with a short, uh, short looking back uh, to 70 years Bach research in Leipzig. In November, 70 years ago, it was founded, and of, of course, we had uh, we thought of a, a celebration of a jubilee celebration, but now it's not possible, and we will postpone it. So, um, yeah, let me take a short look back. Uh, after World War II, Bach research in Leipzig started with a focus, a very strong focus only on J.S. Bach's music and on uh, editing together with the Johann Sebastian Bach Institute in Göttingen, uh, the scholarly edition, the complete works edition, and the, um, the documents, the Bach documents. Uh, now we have uh, seven volumes of Bach uh, documents in which uh, only small passages of whole of uh, of whole documents are presented, and these are nevertheless um, a strong basis for every further Bach research, which is well known, of course. Uh, since the reunification of both parts of Germany in 1990. Um, the research in Leipzig focused on more than J.S. Bach, also on the Bach family, um, the ancestors on the one side and the children, of course, the sons on the other side. And this double perspective is now crucial 
for the scholarly activities of the Leipzig team, I would rather say. What does this exactly mean? Um, now, after completing the new Bach, um, Neue Bach Gesamtausgabe, we nevertheless continue this um, editing work um, for Neue Bach Ausgabe revised edition. And I myself, I'm working on the organ works, uh, which does mean that we have a lot to do um, regarding the transmission of Bach sources after Bach's death mission within the Bach circles of, uh, of Bach lovers of, of, uh, in, in Bach's time and also in, during the time of um, first part of 19th century. And this uh, part of Bach reception is to be um, scholarly revised in the critical report very much because in those volumes in the beginning of uh, Neue Bach Ausgabe, the knowledge on Bach uh, organ works was not as broad as it is today. So this is a wide field for research which lies before us. And I will try to start uh, with this work concerning the so-called 18 chorales. Of course, we do more uh, in uh, concerning finding more Bach documents, which is since 1990, a uh, very broad aspect of our, of our work. And some of my colleagues are only focusing on this, as you all know. Uh, the third part, which is very important now, is of course Bach Digital, which is used uh, from about um, 600 or 700 users, different users a day. So this is a strong task for us to, uh, to see what do the users really want from Bach Digital? What do they need? And in which way could we enhance um, these needs? So the transparent documentation of Bach reception and of Bach resources is a strong task for us nowadays. Um, and it is also um, the documentation of the whole of music of the whole Bach family, of course, the Altbachisches Archiv. Now we are preparing a new catalog, uh, work catalog of all the members before J.S. Bach and uh, ongoing work on Bach, work catalogs of the Bach sons. Now, one of my colleagues is uh, working on uh, CP Bach's instrumental music. And I myself, as I was um, uh, introduced, I'm working on the new Bach Werke Verzeichnis, which probably will come out next year, hopefully. Uh, so, these are relevant outputs, as we think, of all kinds of research on Bach and uh, music of the Bach family as a whole. So we prepare uh, primary sources which other scholars could use or musicians could use for their work. So our, as most of you know, the basis of our work is primary source um, based, yes. Our plans for the future, our strategies for the future are um, research that is both relevant for performance practice and for scholarly work. For example, even better documentary evidence of performance practice in Bach's Saxony or Bach's Thuringia, uh, and more transparent and easy access to documents as a whole and to sources, both metadata and digital images. Which brings me to the last aspect of my short uh, introduction. We want to enhance the possibilities of digital humanities for all source-based scholarly activities. We want to make Bach digital, digital in a way more powerful, allowing and enabling users to communic 
communicate with each other and with us. The need is there, we think, for exchange on words, exchange on sources, and all aspects of performance practice. And we want to strengthen the documentary basis for all research on Bach. As I said before, we have about 600 or 700 users. So I would like to announce today that we plan a project called Bach Digital Smart uh, coming out in 2021, which has three goals, gaining new generations of Bach scholars, which I think is very crucial and important for our work in general, and bringing scholars and musicians together and enabling better ways of access to knowledge, to proved knowledge, and uh, provide a real and substantial basis for all research. For that reason, we aim a cooperative style of Bach Digital more collaboration or participation from the international Bach community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blanken, for your wonderful presentation. And our second guest tonight is Professor Daniel R. Melamed, who is a professor of music and musicology at Indiana University Jacobs School of Music. His research interests focus on J.S. Bach, Mozart era opera, and music of the 17th and 18th century. He is president of the American Bach Society and director of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project. He is the author of numerous monographs on Bach's B minor mass, Christmas oratorio, Passions, Motets, and several other groundbreaking studies published in books and journals. Tonight, his presentation will respond to the question, who is the audience for a Bach society? So, Professor Melamed, the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation to participate with all these uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, my name is Dan Melamed, and I serve as president of the American Bach Society, the ABS. I've been involved with the ABS since my time as a young graduate student. It was at an ABS conference that I gave my very first public paper on Bach. I've had the opportunity to serve the American Bach Society in many different capacities and have gotten a great deal from it, have felt very supported. I have noticed over the years, though, a persistent question. And every once in a while, this question gets asked explicitly, but no, mostly it isn't asked. It's just in the background. What is the American Bach Society for? Whom is the American Bach Society for? What more broadly is the purpose of a Bach Society and who is a Bach Society's audience? Now, the history of the American Bach Society makes it clear how this was viewed at the start, as you can read on the ABS website, AmericanBachSociety.org. Uh, the ABS began as a chapter of the Neue Bach Gesellschaft. The NBG was founded in 1900, and of course, as we were he hearing earlier, it was the successor to the Bach Gesellschaft, an organization that existed from 1850 to 1900, and whose primary work was the publication of the first complete edition of all of Bach's music, the Bach, known now, of course, as the Bach Gesellschaft Ausgabe. Once that was complete in 1900, the um, Bach Gesellschaft uh, dissolved itself, and it was succeeded by the Neue Bach Gesellschaft. And with the work of collecting and editing Bach's music finished, as far as they were concerned, um, the aim of the new organization was to make Bach's works known throughout the world. And one of the eventual consequences of that was the founding of the American Bach Society in 1972 as a chapter, as a sort of colonial outpost of the organization uh, in the main organization in the home country. Now, the American organization was for a long time largely a somewhat different organization from the Neue Bach Gesellschaft overall. The German organization sponsored scholarship, of course, and published the Bach Jahrbuch, but it also sponsored an annual Bach festival 
one of the most important musical events in the German-speaking world. And the German organization long counted practicing musicians, organists, church musicians, and so on, among its members. Um, the American Bach Society had and still has such members too, but most of its work was scholarly. Every three years and then eventually every two years it would hold a scholarly conference, it still does. Um, its publication series, Bach Perspectives, um, is a scholarly essay collection uh, issued every two years. It offers grants for Bach research and prizes for publications on Bach scholarship. It is, in other words, largely focused on the academic world and on a relatively small circle of academic Bach specialists. All this was immensely successful. Conferences have taken place since 1976. The increasingly informative newsletter, now known as Bach Notes, uh, now includes substantive articles and reviews of important publications. Uh, the publication series Bach Perspectives, the essay collection, um, is uh, uh, going strong. Uh, Bach Perspectives 14 is now being edited and will be published um, in a couple of years. It has given, the ABS has given out research grants continuously since 1992 and given awards to publications by young scholars since the same year. But I think we've had to ask whether this is sustainable, whether this model will continue to work in today's world. This is, first of all, a scholarly problem because fewer and fewer people define themselves as Bach scholars in the way they identify as academics. That's really not how most of the musicological field is organized any longer. I realize that the specialists uh, here um, represent uh, people who have primarily uh, often have devoted their careers to Bach scholarship and will continue to identify themselves that way. But I think if you look at the way the musicological and musical scholarly fields have advanced, uh, that's simply not going to be the primary way that people who are interested in Bach, uh, among other things, define themselves. So it's not clear that there's this going to be the same constituency uh, forever. Musicology in many ways, of course, starts with Bach studies, but it doesn't mean it will continue to be at its center and we can't pretend that it will. Second, um, the way the American Bach Society and other societies to a certain extent have operated um, simply doesn't engage a broader audience for Bach. It doesn't consistently speak to performers of Bach, listeners to lovers of Bach's music. Now, the American Bach Society began taking steps a number of years ago to change this. Uh, it issued a CD recording of obscure organ works in 1997. A real turning point, though, was in the year 2000, the Bach anniversary year, um, in which the ABS sponsored a public symposium at the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Um, it put Bach scholarship and Bach criticism in front of a much broader audience and was connected directly with performances. The ABS has come to sponsor books with a broader readership than just Bach scholars. Uh, for example, uh, the publication by the Illinois University Press of Christoph Wolf and Marcus Sepp's um, book on Bach organs, trans um, translated um, uh, uh, for English-speaking readers. More recently, from the same press, Robert Marshall and Trouda Marshall's uh, extraordinary travel guide to Bach sites uh, 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 all over the um, places where Bach lived and works, worked. These are both available, of course, and in print from the University of Illinois Press. These speak to a larger readership. The American Bach Society began sponsoring a vocal competition for young Bach singers together with the Bethlehem Bach Choir one of um, America's oldest Bach organizations. Uh, that competition has taken place since 2000 and uh, every couple of years has recognized new voices in Bach performance. That vocal competition is soon to be joined by a new uh, musical competition for high school aged pianists focusing on their performances of pieces from Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier. That's the fruit of a large bequest to the American Bach Society um, and a, the competition will be in honor of Ruth Monty, a, a keyboard player, uh, and in honor of her love of Bach, donated by her uh, now uh, late husband. Um, and so you can look soon for um, 
uh, an outreach to young pianists uh, and interest in cultivating uh, their um, playing of Bach music. The American Bach Society will very soon launch a new publication series, uh, ABS Guides, published by Oxford University Press. These will be short, readable, well-informed listener guides to great music by Bach. Um, they will, uh, will be written by Bach experts, but aimed at general readers. The first volumes should appear in late 2021 or early 2022. They are designed to bring scholarly work on Bach to a broad audience. And I will add that um, Dr. Ruth Tatlow, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes, uh, will be the author of uh, one of those volumes. The ABS has a new video series with a similar aim, reaching out to a broader audience. These are called Tiny Bach Concerts. You can find them on our YouTube channel. They feature excellent performances on video of a short work or movement by Bach with some introductory comments from an ABS expert on Bach's music. Uh, they, the first two are available on our YouTube channel as we are recording this, and by the time everybody gets a chance to hear this discussion, uh, the next one will be out as well. Our aim is to reach a diverse audience with diverse kinds of performers and performances of Bach's music. Other initiatives. Uh, we are starting to increase uh, our cooperation with Early Music America, an advocacy organization for older music uh, operates in the United States. We have um, given grants and are, we'll start giving grants to increase the diversity of attendance at our conferences and in diversity in work on Bach in many dimensions, diversity of voices we hear and the kind of topics they pursue. We have started bringing performer scholars uh, back into our leadership and we will soon announce the co-sponsorship of a Bach podcast that is um, widely circulated and brings um, news and insight on publications on Bach uh, to listeners around the world. In all, the scholarly mission of the American Bach Society will continue, but we're gonna to continue to expand the audience for our work and for Bach on the thought that uh, the audience for a Bach Society um, needs to be broader than just um, Bach scholars. We hope to draw in participants and listeners uh, to Bach from uh, many different spheres. Thank you. Thanks indeed, Professor Melamed, for your words. It is my pleasure now to introduce Mrs. Villamain Moy, representing the Netherlands Bach Society and the exciting project All of Bach. She is in fact the managing director of the Netherlands Bach Society since 2018. She studied political science and musicology in Amsterdam and Utrecht. Villeneuve worked for several companies in the Netherlands arts and music field. She started as a record producer and marketeer at a CD label, worked as a music program maker for the Dutch World Service, and was head of the music department of the Dutch Performing Arts Fund. Before joining the MBS, she was music manager at Radio 4, the Dutch public radio station for classical music. She is an amateur violinist, pianist, and singer. The Netherlands Bach Society wants to share Bach's word with as many people as possible. Concerts, talent development, and education are important efforts to achieve this goal. Through the online video project All of Bach, the Netherlands Bach Society gives the whole world the opportunity to join the musical world of J.S. Bach. Mrs. Moy, the floor is yours. Um, so, my name is Willemijn, you pronounced it well. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think um, we are a Bach Society, uh, but totally different, I think, from um, the American Bach Society, because that is um, focused, of course, on the scientific uh, part. And I think that we are very much into the performing side of Bach. So let's start with a brief history of the, of the Netherlands Bach Society, and then I will focus on our online video platform, All of Bach, because I think that is really the, well, how we distinguish ourselves from the other Bach societies, probably. The main reason for setting up a Bach Society in the Netherlands was the dissatisfaction with the performance of uh, Bach's Matthew Passion in the Amsterdam Concertgebouw under the baton of Willem Mengelberg. A huge orchestra, huge choir, and of course in a hall and not in a church. So a group of neat gentlemen from a well-to-do part of the Netherlands 
uh, decided that Bach's Passion deserved better. And they founded the Nederlandse Bach Vereniging, that's our Dutch name, in 1921. Uh, so that's almost um, 100 years from then. Um, as the venue was chosen, the big church in Naarden, it's a 16th century, very beautiful church um, in a small fortified town, some uh, 20, 25 kilometers from Amsterdam. And the tradition to perform an annual St. Matthew Passion in this particular church exists ever since 1921. So that's very special. When we had to cancel our Matthew Passion uh, performances this year because of the pandemic, um, it was the first time ever since 1945, uh, the last year of the war, of course, that we were not able to perform a St. Matthew Passion. And that was something that the press really took because it was, you know, it's such a tradition. So everybody knows it. Uh, people from the Dutch cabinet will visit our annual performances. So that's what we are famous for, our annual Matthew Passion. But we think it's not enough. And we also think that Bach is much more than this in St. Matthew Passion. Um, over the years, the Bach Society in the Netherlands has grown into an internationally renowned ensemble. Uh, we have broadened the repertoire, it's not only Bach. And in addition to giving concerts, we are committed to talent development, to education, to innovation, which is very important these days. And I think in addition to this as well, um, our artistic leaders always try to, as it were, translate recent musicology, uh, musicological uh, discoveries into sounding music on the podium. In 2010, so now 10 years ago, the then management of the Bach Society realized that we were heading for our centenary in the 2021-22 season. So something special had to be done, um, preferably something with a long duration and a lot of impact. And so all of Bach was born. Video recordings of all of Bach's works on one dedicated website, freely accessible to the whole world. The project would run for a long time. The aim was that the last recordings would be made in 2022 at the centenary. Um, it's not going to happen. We will not have recorded every work of Bach in 2022. We are still working on it. And I will tell you why, because I think it's a good thing that you're still working on it. All of Bach got off to a promising start in Um, but it didn't immediately meet the expectations of the founders. The visitor numbers were not as high as expected. The visibility of the project was insufficient. And many visitors were not aware that this was a project of the Netherlands Bach Society, which was a pity, of course, because it's a precious project and we really wanted it to, to be ours. This changed in 2018, when a new artistic director, Schoenske Sato, and a new managing director, that was me, uh, were appointed. We, as leaders of the MBS, were determined to really share the beautiful, precious project with the whole world. And we made two decisions. The first one was that we uh, decided that we had to uh, stop with all of Bach.com, the dedicated website. And we uh, moved all the material to our own renewed website of the MBS. So then it was completely clear that all the material was made by us. That was a very good decision, I think. And the second was that we were determined to start our own All of Bach channel on YouTube. Um, that's something we started in September 2018. It was a lot of work, but it was worth it. It did the trick. The reach of our videos increased spectacularly. And at last, every visitor knew that the material came from the Netherlands Bach Society. Um, Maybe it's nice to share some statistics with you, especially around the All of Bach YouTube channel. Today, we have over 204,000 subscribers to the channel and almost 35 million views for all the videos that we are exposing now on the channel. Who are those viewers? Funny enough, two thirds are men. 70% is men. So where, where are the females? I don't know. Um, maybe we come to speak about this. Uh, they come from all over the world. The top five is United States, 
Japan, Germany, the Netherlands, and then France. So where is Italy? I don't know. <laughs> they, should, they should come, I think. Something um, we are very happy about is the age of our visitors, because they're very young. The largest group of our visitors is 25 to 35. That's 23% of our visitors, followed by the group of 35 to 45, 17%. So 40% of the visitors is quite young for a classical audience. And of course, that gives hope for the future for all of us, I think. Maybe you would like to know uh, what kind of video is favorite with our audience. Funny, it's um, very much about uh, solo works. So the most spectacular video we have is Stuart Pinkholm playing the second cello suite by Bach in the Concertgebouw. Um, that was viewed 2.6 million times, uh, which is really a lot also for us. Uh, it's followed by another cello suite by our own Lucia Swartz. Uh, 1.5 million views, not bad at all. And then, of course, there's a lot of uh, acclaim for the big works like St. John Passion, St. Matthew Passion, the B minor mass. And actually, this December, we would record the first part, the first three cantatas of the Weihnachts Oratorio. Um, but we had to cancel the whole recording session because of safety reasons. We cannot work at this moment, like, uh, well, you know why. Um, that's a pity, but we will try to do it in 21, maybe even in the summer, and then we will just put the Christmas tree around us and do as if it is Christmas. Um, I think although Olbach started as an anniversary project with an end date, we already decided in 2018 that we didn't want to say goodbye to it. It offers us so many possibilities. It turns out to be a fantastic communication channel, especially during these trying times. In addition to the recordings of Bach works, we have made informative background documentaries in recent years. We have recorded two wonderful projects with kids, uh, one around the harpsichord, another with a Baroque violin. Um, and next project will be with young singers, children singers. I think it's lovely. Um, and we keep on trying to approach Bach's music from different angles. Um, I think now more than in the past, Next year, we will have, a, um, I think, rather spectacular video with the musical offering, um, because that's really musical editing. So you will see Shunsuke Sato playing a canon with himself in one image, and it will be very special. Um, so the music is portrayed in the film. I think it will work. I hope so. Um, as an international Bach society, I think, um, we notice that our efforts are highly appreciated. The most wonderful thing about the channel is probably the impact. Of course, the channel is of great value as a repository of cultural heritage, but maybe even more important is the value it has in the lives of the people we reach with our music. And I think there, Daniel, Melamed and me, we will reach each other in the audience. It's very important to reach your audience with what you do. Um, I found two lovely quotes under the St. Matthew Pen, uh, Passion uh, video today. One is, this beautiful performance shows us the best of what we're capable of when there are so many reminders in the world of the worst of us. Thank you from a very full heart. And there's another one. Thank you, Netherlands Bach Society, for this gift in, two, uh, in 2020, for bringing us such beautiful light when we are in so much darkness. And we get lots of quotes like this. So to conclude, um, with all of Bach, the Netherlands Bach Society literally shows what it stands for, introducing as many people as possible to the beautiful world surrounding Bach's music to bring comfort and joy in an accessible and artistic way that suits our times. Thank you to Mrs. Mai for this exciting presentation and for your job. Our last but not least speaker tonight is Dr. Ruth Tetlov, representing the Bach Network. She is one of the leading international Bach scholars. Her research is widely published and includes two monographs published by Cambridge University Press. In spring 2020, she was a fellow of the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study. She is a visiting research fellow at Uppsala University and chair of the Bach Network Council. 
Her research has attracted more, much critical acclaim and several awards, including the Choice Award Outstanding Academic Title 2016 for Bach's Numbers. Her presentation tonight is titled Bach Network, Facil Facilitating Bach Dialogue Internationally. So Dr. Tetlap, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Chiara, for inviting me and uh, inviting me to join this, this uh, exciting panel. Um, yes, my title, Facilitating Bach Dialogue Internationally, is quite uh, immodest in, in one respect, since we started very, very modestly. Uh, the, the aim of Bach Network, uh, it, it arose in a pub in a discussion between uh, Reinhard Strom, the Oxford professor, John Butt, uh, by then a professor up in Glasgow, and me, and the realization that there was no, um, uh, no place to discuss academic Bach studies in Britain. And so we thought, well, let's do what we can. We can run a little conference. And um, so this, this is where we began. There was no basis, there was no ground. It was just that there was a lack and we wanted to discuss Bach. So the international bit was not on the, on the table. Very soon, 2004, we came up with the title Bach Network UK. It had a UK in it, so that it was distinctive. And we had a sort of mission statement. We had something that we wrote on our website, which was uh, the central aim of facilitating contacts to encourage thought about Bach and his music. And the ideal being that we could develop thought that may be quite different from the established terms of academic discourse. So there's a little bit of strangeness there. We were not trying to reproduce what already was happening. It was supposed to be a little bit lively. So um, John Butt, Reinhard Strom and I sat down and we worked out how we might proceed. We realized in these days we needed a website. It was 2004. Uh, we needed some kind of identity and I happened to have a, a teenage son who liked to hack and do computers and so he, he made us a logo and uh, then he made us a website. That was our first very simple website and um, so that was live in 2005. So we had an identity but as you can hear it's very homegrown, very small scale, no big grants, in fact no grants, nothing in the bank. And um, Benjamin, my son, remains our uh, much appreciated webmaster 15 years later. So we are still very much homegrown. Um, now, what happened was uh, we realized that actually we were trying to reach the individual. And I think that's remained much of our distinctive, distinction. We may have international reach but the individual and uh, encouraging individuals on a one-to-one -one level is, is really what, what we do, personal interactions. So over the years, we've made lots and lots of friends. Um, we as uh, the first small meetings uh, began in Oxford, a group of invited scholars to discuss what we could do, what will be distinctive and where we could uh, you know, fill a gap. That was Oxford 2005. And then that became an annual fixture. We, we came up with the name Dialogue Meeting because we wanted to discuss, that's exactly what we wanted to do. But then it kind of became unsustainable. Why were we meeting every year? And we realized that we could actually use very usefully the biennic, biennial Baroque Conference and put our papers there. And that would reach, we would reach many more people. We would meet many more young scholars. So that's what we did. And so each year we met either at the Biennial Baroque or at our own dialogue meeting. Um, you can actually read all the reports of our dialogue meeting since 2005 on our website. And I've just done that. And it was a really lovely trip down memory lane. Lots of people that we remember and, that we, and lots of discussions we had. Um, something that came along the way was that we realized that young scholars needed a platform. And so we have deliberately always made a platform for the younger scholars, um, often speaking alongside senior scholars so that there's an interaction and uh, giving uh, the younger scholars a chance to publish very often in the young scholars, um, in the young, young scholars uh, area of our journal, Understanding Bach. And Understanding Bach 
sort of grew it just was organic what what did we do with these really good papers that we were hearing and these good presentations of new research and we decided we would we would do it so we got another logo and another little link on our uh, on our website and there we had a design for understanding Bach and um, we wanted everyone to be able to read it without a fee we have no membership as I said very little in the bank uh, no supporters. We wanted it to be totally open access and yet we wanted it to have the pedigree of an academic journal so it was always peer-reviewed. First, first volume was published in 2006 and uh, I, I started it. Very soon Yotamita joined me and uh, we, we ended up publishing 12 volumes which was uh, annually and they're all there and the series stopped in 2017 continues to be read regularly and I have got some statistics somewhere but they're not as interesting as Villamine's. <laughs> um, several of those articles have been reprinted with permission uh, as well as translated and published in different languages so that you know there's there is some reach there. Um, and again, it, it was very often the first platform for our young scholars and it, it gives them something on their curriculum vitae and we were able to offer that. Another thing that's been happening is that we've collaborated and cooperated with other Bach societies and this became very, very important. Quite a few of us uh, regularly attend or regularly attended the American Bach Society things, so we made friends across the channel. Uh, many of us visit Leipzig and at the, our friends at the Leipzig Bach Archive uh, and at the Biennial Baroque we meet many, many uh, international people. Um, we very soon lost our UK title. We realised that actually our friends were international and what we were doing was, was sort of putting some kind of homegrown face, some kind of, I don't know, sometimes a human face with a smaller meeting uh, where the competitive spirit could be relaxed and that there was an open-mindedness uh, uh, introduced into the community in, in, in a study where actually we all know it had been very competitive and uh, very often a little bit unkind and so that's what we we've been able to uh, do that and, and of course other bar societies are doing that it's happening increasingly so what do we still do we contribute still to the biennial baroque conference and that's what uh, we're doing our dialogue meetings continue our next one we've just postponed and now it's going to be july 2022 from uh, last year we've been contributing something small to the leipzig bach fest which is an exciting new development and we're contributing this year to um, a dialogue discussion on bach und erlösung and a month ago on the 28th of October, we launched our next um, new multimedia publication, Discussing Bach. Um, of course, pandemic circumstances are forcing us to adapt and rethink, and that's an opportunity for us all to grow and to avoid getting stuck in, in old ways. And that's one of the beauties of our small homegrown society because we don't really have any traditions. So we really can say, what are we going to do next? and it's not going to offend anybody. So what do we aim to do? Well, uh, the principles remain the same, personal contacts, encouraging isolated, younger and older scholars. This has been happening actually during the lockdown. We set up a weekly tea time, which was sort of holding out a hand to our friends and maintaining it through Zoom tea times. No agenda, just friendship. Um, yeah, so I think, what can I say? People first, Bach studies second or parallel? I don't know. But uh, what influence we are having? That's hard to know. Uh, here's, I've got some statistics. We have 803 followers on Facebook and 670 subscribers who've signed up on our website to receive news. And the late, latest demographics from our recent uh, three weeks ago letter shows that Unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately, 65% of the recipients are male over the age of 45. It could be worse, but uh, we obviously have more, more work to do um, because this does reflect a little bit of imbalance. Um, 
And, but it's interesting that the social media site is proving more popular than the more conventional membership-like sign up. So we have a long way to go, and we're always welcoming new ideas that are sustainable. And uh, yeah, that's it, really. Thank you very much, Ruth, for your presentation. And of course, the dialogue meetings have been very important for both Maria and myself. And the idea for this conference actually was born during a coffee break at Manili Hall. So <laughs> thank Sorry. you very much indeed. We are all particularly honored by the presence of these distinguished musicians, scholars, and managers tonight, because they represent the polyphony of the Bach societies worldwide. Italy has seen some important societies which were created in the name of Bach. The first known example was the Società Bach, whose very name translated into Italian that of the Bach Gesellschaft. It operated between the 19th and 20th century and achieved some important results thanks to the efforts of its founders, Alessandro Costa and Uberto Bandini. Already in the 1880s, they organized the performances of Bach's Magnificat and of some choirs excerpted from the B minor mass. After the Second World War, in the late 50s, Bach Society by the German name of Romische Bach Gesellschaft was funded by Reinhard Hachwald in Rome, but mainly attracted the attention of the German expatriate. The youngest among these societies is the one funded by Chiara Bertoglio and myself, JSBach.it. In spite of its young age and of its small size, the society is enthusiastic and eager to learn from the elder siblings, whose activity we know and admire. Our main goals are to promote the encounter of musicians and musicologists in the name of Bach, fostering a greater knowledge, dissemination and appreciation of Bach's works in our country and in the larger context of the Bach society. We would now like to invite our guests to respond to the presentations they have heard and to interact with each other. Listeners are also welcome to ask questions and to comment upon the presentations. Uh, we have a question from Marianna yeah. Pagliero, who is uh, a valued cooperator of our society and uh, a volunteer. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for letting me and us take part of this uh, round table. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank the four of you because uh, I find very, very interesting these four very different approaches to the concept of society because I think it's because of the different uh, personality of the culture that you all represent, you bring this forward in a very different way. So based on that, I would like to ask um, for your idea of society, for the society that you are um, moving on, uh, which gulf is easiest or hardest to bridge, uh, if the one between musicology and performance, or the one between scholarly studies and the larger public, and also um, on which one you make more effort, which one is the priority for you, and which one is eventually in a second position. Thank you very much. I can make a start if yeah. you want. Yeah, please. <laughs> I think for us, because we are mainly a performing organization, I mean, um, our, our identity is, I think, the ensemble we have, which is a vocal instrumental ensemble. So for us, I think um, the most important bridge to gap is between uh, scholarly studies and the larger public. Um, I think the first one between musicology and performance is not so difficult because if you find something out and you, you can translate it easily to performance practice. But the second thing you have to do is to think about the audience. Do they like it? Um, I can give you a good example, I think, with the Kunst der Fuge, which is a rather long and abstract word. A work, as you all know, it's all D minor, uh, it's fugues, it's, it's complicated music. Um, around one theme, it's it's very uh, it's almost um, like math, I think. So, how do you um, make this music accessible for an audience? And we are thinking about that. We will make a recording in September, and we will work with um, a stage director. So we have really thought about forming groups for the different um, fugues. We really have thought about the audience to make this uh, this music accessible. 
So it's our task, I think. We really should do this. Um, so for me, that one is the most important one. But, but also, it, it, is, it is not, a, not an easy one, but I like it because it, it, uh, it asks something from our creativity. Thank you. Thank you. I could come in there with a totally different answer, and that is that when we started, we, our aim was to draw in the performers as well. We wanted to be 50% performers, 50% academics, all of them, all of us discussing Bach. But we found that because the training was so different and the expectations were so different, and yeah, because you could say the academics were were working on something that communicated so easily in, 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 a, in a dialogue meeting format, it was much more difficult to attract and keep the attention of the performers who were, even, were thinking deeply, but we were asking very different questions. So we have failed miserably as far as that is concerned. <laughs> but we will, we will continue to try. I'll start by saying that uh, I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about communicating scholarship on Bach to a broader audience. My last two books have been aimed at general readers, although they are based in, let's call it real musicology, real Bach scholarship. Um, I run a cantata series here in Bloomington, the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project, in which we, each event combines a performance of the cantata with a short talk about it, and then a second performance of the cantata, which is always really interesting. And we have a, we have a large following. Uh, and we're starting to get a bigger following, of course, since we're now recording and putting things on YouTube. And there seems, to be, you know, with these and other efforts, there really seem to, seems to be an endless thirst on the part of listeners to and lovers of Bach for, um, for learning about, especially learning about the music and what kinds of things one can listen for and 18th century ways of listening and so on. And the, the audience is clear and obvious and often eager. I, I like Ruth Tatlow, I think I have found it more difficult to figure out in some respect how to speak broadly to performers. Now in my role as a professor at the Jacobs School of Music here, I regularly teach courses on Bach and mostly to graduate students. Um, uh, performers mostly, um, who uh, are quick to, to engage with the kinds of things I want them to think about. Um, it's a little harder for them to figure out how it might relate to their performance. But it's a paradox of early music education, I think around the world, is that performers of this repertory have been trained and asked and encouraged to think about it in scholarly and historical ways. And to the point that I think it's not always clear to them, given that they have some of this experience, um, why they would want to bring a non-performing outsider in to do something that they've been started, started on uh, at the beginning. And I, I fully understand that. Um, it runs the risk of meddling in something they already have, a, a beginning, at least the beginnings of an education um, in. Uh, I don't mean that there's necessarily a kind of automatic resistance on many performers' parts. I think they have the same curiosity. But I think the more that performance training and performance practice training and historical performance training has come to include the kind of things that Bach scholars has been, uh, interested, have been interested in, it's a little harder to see what the role of a pure scholar might be um, in advising somebody who already actually knows a lot about this. I think there are things to add. I think one thing that scholars can do is encourage people to think about things in new ways, because it might be the nature of, of performance and performance training is that you find a way of thinking about something and performing something that makes sense to you and stepping outside that is a, is a, a big task. But I, I find this paradoxical that the better trained in these matters that performers are, the harder it is to find a way to, to communicate in this way. Uh, don't you think, Daniel, that this requires um, a certain amount of talent also? I mean, uh, there are musicians who are able to talk about uh, music and also the, maybe even the, the musicological approach of music. And still they have the ability to translate all their knowledge 
to, um, to, to, to normal people, uh, not musicologists. Um, I think, for example, that Shunke Sato, that's our artistic leader, um, really has this ability. We played in Japan, uh, Japan last year for 1400 Japanese girls uh, aged something like between 12 and 16 or something. Very difficult um, audience. It would be in the Netherlands very difficult. But he tried to explain um, the difference between modern instruments and authentic Baroque instruments, for example. So why is there a traverso and why is there this flute? Or what is the difference between a piano and a harpsichord? And that really, really worked. So it's also a matter of talent, I think. And I think that yes, children yes, have the good questions also to make us think. So working yeah. with children is, is it, a good way. It is. And what we're talking there is about a third line of communication between performers and listeners. We haven't talked so much about that. And I frankly don't see that, I mean, a, talented performer who is good at communicating in that way needs a, you know, a Bach scholar interfering with that, with that <laughs> communication. So I, I think I agree with you, um, agree with you completely. Uh, the musician needs the scholarship himself. He needs to be, uh, he needs to know a lot. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. And, and so many, so many good performers of this repertory uh, do, do exactly that. Uh, I guess that's my point is that there it is. Um, maybe, maybe we come back to the idea that one of the things that scholars can do is to say, stop, wait, um, are you sure that's the only way to think about this? Um, I guess I spent a lot of time doing that. Do we really know that? Is that, is that the way we, is that the only way to think about it? I think that uh, our conference uh, in these days uh, is showing that the dialogue between musicologists and musicians can be really fecund. Uh, we have many presenters who are offering lecture recitals, so this is a, a kind of a testimony of how music and musicology can interact and also coexist. And in, in fact, one of our speakers uh, is uh, a musician and musicologist, is Stefano Campanini, and he has a question for Professor Melaned. Bonsoir uh, to everyone. Uh, yes, my question is um, if you can um, see some differences between the American way of playing Bach and uh, listening to Bach and in another European way of playing Bach and listening to Bach. So if uh, uh, you can see differences between uh, these two continents. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I will give a brief answer and then hope that the others on the panel will, will provide a perspective on this too. Um, it's hard to answer because you'd first have to define what an American way is. Uh, that's a, there's a lot of ways. And then even more difficult is asking what a European way is. I guess we could ask the EU about, about what the European uh, way of listening to Bach is. Um, one obvious distinction that comes to mind is um, the, as much as American musicians and scholars have absorbed Bach and adopted Bach as their own, it will always be a different relationship from, say, um, a German musician or scholar who uh, cultivates Bach. Um, there's a famous story of the composer John Cage, um, I believe at one of the Darmstadt courses, in which um, somebody asked him, isn't it hard to compose living so far from the center of the musical tradition as an American? And his response was characteristic. He says, isn't it really difficult to compose living so close to the center of the tradition? Um, and, and he was right, of course, in the way that John Cage um, so often was, in that there's, there's, one has different perspectives depending on where you stand in relation to the tradition. And for scholarship and for performance, I think the difference certainly between pursuing this in, in North America and pursuing it, well, certainly in Germany, but maybe elsewhere in Europe too, is the difference between um, feeling that you are a continuation necessarily perhaps of the culture uh, represented by Bach 
and feel you are someone perhaps to a certain extent from the outside coming to it and having learned to appreciate it. Um, I, I would really be interested to know what my colleagues on the panel think about this question from a different perspective. I think it's difficult because I uh, I do agree that it's hard to say that there is an American way of playing Bach, <laughs> let alone that there would be a European uh, way to play Bach. I, I only think that the audiences have different uh, preferences. I think that we in Europe maybe have more affinity with the religious works of Bach than the Americans. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But that's what I gather sometimes from the remarks uh, on the videos we get. Uh, it's also in the Netherlands, it's a very Protestant country originally. So the cantatas are very popular in the Netherlands and the passions are immensely popular. So the preferences may differ, but the way we perform, I don't know, because also um, most ensembles are a blend of many um, nationalities. It's a very, very um, diverse thing. I mean, for example, our leader is Japanese slash uh, American, uh, but he had a lot of his education in Europe, in France and in Germany. So this whole thing will influence the way he uh, approaches Bach. And I can't say whether that is um, eventually Dutch. I don't know. So it's a blend. I, I, think, I think that they do differ in their preferences, but in their uh, performance practice, I wouldn't know. I, I couldn't tell. Yeah, that's a very good point. I wonder whether it might be almost easier to talk about differences in listening practice and the reaction of listeners than it would be to talk about difference in, perf in performance. Uh, my little comment is that I think that the, um, your tradition can weigh very heavily. Am I following a tradition? And am I expected to follow a tradition or am I an outsider, as, as Dan said? Am I an outsider or even worse, am I an interloper? Um, and I think in these days when we can listen to so much, uh, our personality, I would have thought, is going to dictate, I actually prefer this, I like this, can I not do this? And the only thing stopping will be either a tradition or a conductor who says it's got to go like this. So uh, I'm not so sure that it's nationality anymore. Um, or it will, I think it'll become, well, for the reason that Villamin said, you know, these aren't the ensembles, are, they're not one nationality. We are, we are, we are a complete uh, diversity these days. So uh, I think possibly if you'd have asked the question 50 years ago, it would have been easier to answer. Okay, okay, so we um, just we introduce um, Pier Francesco Micicap, who is another um, cooperator of jsdoc.it. And uh, okay, Pier Francesco, here we are. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have a question for our speakers and guests um, how to start. Um, communities may uh, enhance the networking aspect among those belonging in it. Um, but they may also create boundaries. So uh, how can back societies avoid the risk of drawing too clear a line between those who are inside and those who are outside? Thank you. I think that uh, behind that question is that being outside or excluded is not a good thing. And I think we'd all agree with that. Um, so I don't know the answer, but just that's where I'm thinking now. But if I can, I try to answer to this question a little bit during my, in my dissertation, my PhD dissertation about the Italian reception. And since I try to define what it, I, I, I try to call Italian, so what Ita it was Italian. And uh, at least I try to define a, a, an area, so a, a country, so a, a place, and a group of people, but belonging not just Italians, so who were born in Italy, but, but also who work in Italy, who come to Italy to listen to concerts, to collaborate, to, to someone who have contact with Italy. 
And so in this sense, and that's also what, what we are trying to do with jsbach.it. So trying to, to maintain a focus on, on, on the Italian aspects, on the Italian context and on the Italian events and so on. And also on the Italian uh, subjects relating to Bach. So, but also always maintaining a, a dialogue with the other, so, so with outside, which is not outside, but some, somewhere else, and with someone who can look at uh, our situation a, from a different perspective. For example, uh, we just uh, included, in, cl uh, we have just included in our society Tom Kopman, who is a well-renowned, internationally renowned um, performer, but for example, who had a special connection with Italy, who lived sometimes, spent sometimes every year in Italy, in North Italy, or who took a, a lot of concerts, who collaborated with a, a very long standing project to perform cantatas in Milan. So also with people who are not primarily connected to Italy, but who work on the Italian context, or who can say something about it. And so just trying to be inclu more inclusive. Yeah, that word inclusive is really important. Um, Maria. Um, and maybe another way to put it would be to, it's a matter of how you think as an insider in the society, as a, in the organization, how, how, you, how you think about yourself and what it is you're doing. It's very easy, say, for example, I mean, maybe even particularly dealing with Bach, for a Bach society or a group of Bach scholars um, to come to be seen as a, some kind of high priesthood um, that is responsible for venerating Bach, but also somehow protecting uh, Bach. And this happens, this happens a great deal, um, not just in Bach, but all over. And to the extent that you, people, that an organization comes to be seen as sort of protecting their subject, they're the ones who actually who know uh, and others don't. And that, of course, is, is very alienating and leads to exactly the sort of problem that our question leads to. Um, but if what an organization does, I think, is manage to cultivate expertise and make it clear that they want to share that expertise, that paints a very different, um, that paints a very different picture. And I'll give you a good example from, um, uh, Christina Blanken's um, uh, home base, and that is some of the exhibits in the uh, wonderful Bach Museum in, in Leipzig. If you've been there, and if you haven't, you really should uh, see it. Some of those exhibits are very technical. Uh, I think of one in which they explain to the lay museum visitor um, what's behind all this technical Bach scholarship that's sorted out paper and handwriting and copyists and watermarks and so on, and how that in turn um, tells us things we want to know about Bach's music. It's a terrific exhibit. I mean, I spend my time dealing with this stuff every day, and I still found it appealing, and I could see other people in the museum gravitating to this because it's inviting. It invites people in to share the expertise represented at the Bach Archive and in this kind of scholarship. And that exhibit and many others at the museum are, are models, I think, of how to do this. They're not there to, to, to these organizations aren't there to suggest how one ought to uh, treat Bach. They're there to offer their expertise and curious people will, will, will want to know. So. Um, I, I think the kind of exhibit at the Bach Museum is a, um, behind which is real expertise um, is, a, is a really good, that represents a really good model. So thank you. And Stefano Campanini is asking again. Is how a Bach society can um, put together the scientific research and the divulgation. So, um, reaching a, a broad audience, but also a specific audience of scholars of, yes. Okay, thank you. 
yeah, I guess that this balance between dissemination and and scientific niveau is one of the most di most difficult. Yeah, and I wonder whether um, Dr. Blanken would like to talk about this um, in relation to the two publications that now come out from the Bach Archive, the Bach Yarbuch on the one hand, but the equally informative um, Bach magazine on the other. They represent two very different ways of communicating about Bach. And I, I think the combination is really interesting. Yeah, these are two sides of the same medal, so to say. We want to, uh, uh, to, to make easy access to scholarly knowledge through Bach magazine, this is true. And um, it's um, especially this new Bach magazine, which is coming out uh, this, this day, shows a, a great variety of topics. Uh, relating to Bach, and um, to me, it's it's very important to have this uh, to have this publication possibilities besides real scholarly hard publication like uh, like Bach Yabuch. But one other point I want to um, I want to let you know is um, my idea with Bach Digital is uh, we let people uh, give people the, pop, uh, the opportunity to discuss about certain aspects of a source and uh, which is then shown, uh, shown in, in, the, in Bach Digital on the source page. And then you, you could have a discussion on one source, for example, uh, a, a different version of an organ piece, which could be discussed by a performer and uh, by a scholar, or by, or by a person who is both, or you you discuss about the authenticity of a of a certain work or something like that. I would I would like to have this in combination, real really with the source. So the basis of discussion is is clear which is then the, the manifestation of, of the work in the source. So this would be a new kind of, of, uh, of um, exchange. We have, we have special sites in, in many ways for, for discu discussion on, on Bach topics or old music field of performance practice. There is a lot of and we have Bach cantatas come and we have a lot of things, but it's not this kind of, uh, with a special impetus on, on really source studies. And to me and to Leipzig scholarship, it's especially important to, to show the base, the basis of, of, uh, of our work, special impetus on, on really source studies and to me and to Leipzig uh, scholarship, it's especially important to to show the base, the basis of of, uh, of our work. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now we have uh, a couple of questions uh, from Luca Ronzitti, who is a member of the board of trustees of JSBach.it and also uh, a teacher of music and a music musician himself, Luca. Uh, thanks, Chiara, and good evening, everyone. Thank you a lot for all your intervention. Um, I was thinking that um, among, the, among the great composers, um, as all we know, Bach is probably the only who never left his, his, own, his own country or the German area. area. Uh, nowadays, he is uh, traveling a lot. And so I, I would like to ask uh, to everyone, um, what do you think would be Bach's thought towards this great notoriety and all those new ways to spread his music? I mean, YouTube uh, and, and all recordings. Uh, is this the, the right place 
to listen to Bach music? Well, I try to answer <laughs> because we spread Bach's music so worldwide through YouTube. Um, I, I think there is no answer if this is the right way because who is to decide what is the right way? Um, but I think, um, you know, if you want to share uh, all your thoughts and all your uh, also all your findings from musicology um, to spread the music uh, to as many platforms as possible is probably very good. I mean, we really want to make the people enthusiastic about Bach's music. That's what we all share, I think, here also in this particular forum. Um, I think that Bach would have been delighted, don't you think? I mean, also with the level of, of performance, uh, people nowadays play so good, I think, much better than in his days. Um, I'm almost sure. So... I think that he would be delighted. Uh, I mean, I, I remember that I had my first iPod, I think it was about, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago or something. And it had um, the capacity to store all of Bach's cantatas, all of them, 200. And then also the Passions and also all Mahler symphonies and everything. And, and you know, just imagine that you, that you carry this music in this little box. I think that, you know, um, it would open his mouth and, and he would be very excited, I think. <laughs> I think it's a very good development, yeah. Ruth? I would just say very quickly, and I shall use a source to please Christine here. Um, on Bach's title pages uh, several times, he said that his, his purpose was uh, to um, zu, zur ergetzen, to delight the soul and the spirit. And if he saw how many millions of souls and spirits his uh, music had delighted, uh, one can only say, you know, this is QED, he would be delighted because that was his aim. Thanks, Ruth, of course, you're perfectly right. Luca, you had another question. Um, uh, yes, it was. Uh, it, it's um, it is again to Miss Moy. Um, I heard you what you said before, uh, and it, it was strange to discover that uh, women apparently don't like Bach's music uh, so much. <laughs> uh, which do you think it could be the reason? No, I don't think that women um, dislike. It, it, it's strange because mm, this evening around this table there are four women and only one man. <laughs> no, I think I think that is a conclusion that that um, it, it doesn't work like that. I think in general more men than women uh, search the internet in the first place. Um, and, and we know that uh, the audience for classical music, at least in the Netherlands, is dominated by men. Also the Radio 4 listeners, I worked for the classical public radio station in the Netherlands. We also had more male listeners than female listeners. Uh, so maybe it's, it's, it's just a general thing. It doesn't have to, think, uh, to do something with Bach, I think. It's just the behavior on the internet, classical music, it's just more men than women. I think that, I don't know, the appreciation might be the same. It's just searching on the net and viewing our videos is, is more done by men. But I can't draw to a conclusion by this. I don't know how you would test this, but I wonder whether a little bit comes from the very nature of your internet project, all of Bach, and this tendency toward comprehensive, complete control a uh, tendency toward collection as much as anything else ah, is, uh, is a very male phenomenon. Yeah, you're you, right, you're right. You look yeah. at who's interested in owning in every in every recording. And you're absolutely uh, right. That might it's, be. It's, a, it's probably a very male way of thinking. <laughs> now, I thought maybe that's the answer until I, was it, was it Ruth who said that 65% of your readership turns out to be male? Did you say that? That's close enough to the 70% that this all of Bach theory of mine may not work, that it, it may go across all of these. But it probably doesn't hurt that you announce you're sort of you're kind of a collector of all of Bach, and that might attract a certain a certain psychology. This this is my amateur theory. Maybe we can ask somebody to to do a research uh, project on the appreciation of Bach's music uh, by gender. <laughs> 
would be interesting. That could be a new interesting topic. And look, I, I wanted just to assure you that uh, I just took a, took a look to the to our Facebook page, and jsback.it has fifty three percent of male and the other half female. So we are really equal. And uh, also ten um, percent are between fifteen and. 34 years old and the others are 45 and 64 so really <laughs> this <laughs> very big huge distance so <laughs> thank you maria <laughs> yeah and just i take the chance to introduce again mariana pagliero again who wrote a question from our chat so mariana please yeah good evening again um, you already talked about the history of your own societies or the society you are now leading. I was curious about how um, the priorities, the tasks and the aims have changed in this past decade and how you expect them to change in the few years or decades coming. If only we would knew. No, we we could uh, we, we could foresee and meet the needs. Uh, for me, a principle actually that sort of I, it sort of come up is um, the privilege we have if we can buy uh, journals, if we can buy books, if we can buy these things. And one of the wonderful things uh, about all of Bach and the, uh, the things and and, and the um, Bach Digital is it's free, it's open access, and it's available to anybody 24 seven who has got an internet. And this sort of social, social ability that it doesn't exclude, it also brings in another question we have, it includes. And uh, for me, if, if I was, you know, I don't know how long I'll stay <laughs> around, but you know, I, my, my aim is always that everybody has access freely when they wish they could, so that there's no uh, differentiation between social means. Um, and uh, that, I think that's the very best use of internet. Um, so that, that is something that in, in the society I, I would head up, I would always keep everything open access. Do you think, for example, that all this uh, digitalization of all the information and performances might, uh, for example, uh, affect the actual performances, for example, or I don't know, more musicologies, um, more musicology um, convey or some, some other kind of events will be required in time? Well, I think that uh, when we have these open access discussions, for example, discussing Bach now is taking small subjects, small subject areas and discussing some of these things, which hopefully will address and help help guide a way through to how you use sources and then apply them. Um, but it's not there yet. Okay. Yes, this is also our aim to, to prepare tutorials for students, how they get dive into Bach research or how we can show in, in a way we can show how Bach research is now, which are the, the goals, the next goals, which are the aims, which, which are the topics which are not solved and all these things. We would like to present those topics in Bach Digital also and show shows certain problems and and we want to start with organ music next year and show Bach's cosmos of organ music especially in res with respect to, to students and to young performers who want to dive in more deeply into the field of Bach performance practice and research both together. Thank you. I think uh, go back to the to the earlier part of Mariana's question for just a moment. Um, the American Bach Society was very fortunate a few years ago to receive a large um, financial gift um, from the estate of someone who admired the society. And I have been talking to the American Bach Society since then, since, I mean, for the last few months since I've started serving as president, 
about um, what our obligations are with that, with that money. And it seems to me that it connects directly with, with a topic that a lot of people, certainly in the United States, have been thinking and talking about, and I think around the world, and that is the idea of recognizing ways in which we are privileged. And certainly, um, our privilege in this, in this small example comes from being the stewards of resources. We have the money. And so I have been encouraging us to think about ways in which we can spend that money um, every year on things that bring Bach to other people. That a, a lot, I mean, it's been important to support Bach scholarship and young Bach scholars and so on, and that's will be a part, part of our work. But what can we do with those resources um, to uh, share this with, with other people? We, we're entrusted with these resources, and these resources are connected with a canonical white male composer. Well, we will always be a Bach society, but we can say, what's the most diverse way we can, um, can share this? Oh, I looked, by the way, just to go back to one other point, I looked up the YouTube channel of my own Bloomington Bach Cantata project, and uh, our first cantata, the season cantata 74, has had a lot of views, and the viewership is 60%, 40%, female over male. Good. <laughs> it's not all of Bach, so maybe that's the answer. <laughs> um, I'd like to add that um, I think that we have, uh, as the Netherlands Bach Society, I think we, we both do the, um, two things, preserving uh, cultural heritage by just showing how we play Bach right now. And, you know, uh, that could be interesting for the next generation, for example. And, Probably we will be very old fashioned within two, 20 years or something, but still it's interesting to have, you know, what are we doing right now in 2020 with Bach? And the other thing is that we try to be um, as inclusive as possible. That, that's a goal for the future. And I think that's for all of us. And we all do um, our work very good, I think, in, in that way, uh, to share as much as we can, to be open access, to don't ask money for what we do, um, that's, you know, to, to, to be open and giving and caring and sharing is very important for the next few years. Uh, Stefano has commented that maybe on Instagram, uh, J.S. Bach could have a younger audience. Although, of course, the, the medium is less serious in his words than others. I think that uh, we are, are all engaged uh, with a variety of social media and platforms and so on. And each one of them has uh, its own language and uh, its own style. And I think that also a, a big challenge is the difference between outreach and involvement. Because, uh, for example, in our own uh, small way, our society involves a very large number of young people who are enthusiastic about Bach and who may be professional musicians, but also who can just have a great passion for classical music. The problem is to reach those who are presently not interested or don't know. And uh, this is one reason why we have uh, welcomed the opportunity of transferring this conference on a digital format. At first, we were very scared by the, this idea and also horrified, I must admit. But then uh, we realized that uh, we could be creating a repository of uh, educational videos with uh, cutting edge research, but also uh, communicating it to a very la large audience uh, internationally and also to those who would never had, have had the means to come to Turin. So um, we, we thought that uh, that could be an opportunity instead uh, of a handicap. We are treating it uh, in this fashion, and we hope that uh, this conference will help uh, uh, this kind of outreach. So are there any more questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Michael Marison, for your comment. So once more, thanks to our speakers for their presentations and opinions, and thanks to all those who have asked questions. 
we would, would like to remind you, our listeners that this roundtable will remain available on the web for further consultation. And tomorrow we will have another full day and as you will be able to see on our conference program. So once more, thank you all. Good night and see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>